I remember there was one program I worked on and somebody suggested that you get rid of uh, church lunches after, uh, Sunday lunches after church. Um, and in the South, that's a, that's a, I mean, you don't, you don't get rid of church lunches. Um, that's, that's just how it is. Um, and I think that that for me was a really eye-opening part of it too, is being like, wait, like this community, if we do that, like they're not going to listen to us. Um, but it's also not what the community wants. It's important to them to have that time together on Sundays after service to, to talk about their week, to talk about their upcoming week, to, to see each other because they might not during the week because of work and family. Um, so it's important for us really to remember that the community should be at the heart of everything we're doing, uh, sort of regardless of what, what our own aims and objectives are, uh, especially when we're looking at interventions. Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories podcast, episode number 19. Hi everyone, my name is Amari Richens and I'm currently recording this from an Airbnb um, before I make my way down to the lower 48, as they say, up here in Alaska. I hope that everyone's doing well. Um, I definitely think that you'll take some value from this episode. I was delighted to connect with this person on LinkedIn and really just get to, well, I'm glad to have them on the show to really get to hear the story. And I think uh, there's there definitely some some value and well, lots of value in different parts and different stories. So I'm glad that you're here and you're getting to listen. And um, I hope that everyone's doing well and your semester or your work is going well. And without further ado, here's today's episode. This is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Today, we have another young man in his public health journey. He has his Bachelor's of Public Health from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Then he went on to complete his MPH at Rawlings School of Public Health at Emory University. He's now pursuing his PhD in Health Promotion and Behavior at Georgia State School of Public Health and currently is a Second Century Initiative Fellow at the Georgia State, as well as being the Deputy Team Lead Contact Tracing Data Quality Case Interview COVID-19 Response for Georgia Department of Public Health. We have Robert Fairman, MPH Chess. How are you doing today, Robert? Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to, to talk to you and to learn a little bit more. Yeah, like as, as soon as I, I saw your profile on um, LinkedIn, I was like, all right, this is someone that I kind of want to have on the show. So I'm, I'm glad to have you on as well. So yeah, yeah my pleasure. Um, so I guess, how have you been doing um, during like COVID and, and everything with everything going on? Yeah, I think it's uh it's the ultimate learning experience, right? Like it's, it's one thing to be uh, sort of like in an academic program right now, you know, I'm getting my PhD, so that on its own is a thing. Um, but it's also, you know, a different thing to be on response. I'm working um, with the state, with two counties, as well as with Georgia State on response stuff. So it's really, um, it's sort of coming at you from all angles, you know, and it's, it's, uh, it's a really cool, it, really cool way to understand like sort of how important self-care is Mm. right like if you would have told me like you know a year ago like hey make sure like you dedicate time to yourself each week to like just relax and decompress but no we don't really need that like you have you know monday night bachelor bachelorette and like you can hang out do a face mask then but like that's enough for the week and like it's not um like you know it's it's definitely it's sort of been cool to understand like each day like you have to take time for yourself uh, or else you're just going to be burned out, and that's not good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks for sharing that, and I definitely have have felt that too. I'm definitely, just trying to have time for myself, even if it's like just like a walk to the mailbox sometimes. Because you know, uh, working from home, especially like I've been sitting down so much, and and it, it really isn't good for your health. And then with everything else going on, it's kind of crazy time. So yeah, definitely. Thanks for sharing that. Absolutely. So, yeah. So tell us a little bit about your personal background. Yeah, so I was uh, born and raised in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I'm one of the, we joke that I'm one of the few that was actually born and actually raised inside city limits. Um, so I was born and raised uh, in Charlotte and grew up there and I absolutely love Charlotte. It's a, it's a really great city. Uh, there's a lot of really cool things happening there. Um, and uh, I graduated high school there. Uh, I moved to UNC Wilmington uh, on the coast. 
um, to do four years of undergrad there at the beach and it was it's my favorite place on earth it's it's such a beautiful place and it's, it's really cool it's been uh, what I would say the best four years of my life um, you know an undergrad making friends and learning but also being at the beach I mean it, it's tough to to beat that when your school's a mile away from from the ocean it's really really cool um, I then moved down to Atlanta uh, for my master's um, and then I decided to stay around for a PhD program um, and it's been really cool it's, it's a it's a lot of a journey it's a uh, it's also been a lot of growing experiences. And, and one thing I do want to preface this with is, um, because I think it's important, is my pronouns are he, him, his. Um, and I'm also an openly gay man. Um, and I, I think that's really important for me to start this out with because um, it's important for us to be able to identify. So those listening or those watching this know that there are people like them in academia. There are people like them doing public health response for um, you know, the state of Georgia, which is notorious um for pretty much hating anybody that's not like a straight white rich man um so i do want to say that i think that that's really important for me to preface that yeah and thank you i appreciate that and I'm, I'm glad to have you on and i'm glad to get more um inclusive and diverse perspectives so, so I'm, I'm really happy and excited to jump into this yeah. so before we jump into anything i guess what does public health mean to you um so public health to me means finding ways to make sure that people live longer, healthier, and happier lives. Um, and, and in that journey of understanding what that means for individuals or communities, uh, we, we find what barriers there are. We find how do we need to fight for equity in order to make sure that everyone has the ability, the access, the, um, the resources in order to live these happier, healthier, and longer lives. Um, so for me, public health is all about making sure that we can equip communities, um, we can work with communities, and we can find ways to allow communities and individuals to live longer, happier, and healthier lives. Yeah, yeah and I, I, I love that. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so you have your, your bachelor's in public health. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't interview a lot of people with bachelor's in public health yeah. because public health usually is not the first thing that's on someone's mind, um, in, especially in undergrad. So did you go into your undergrad knowing about public health or, or what was that like? So yes and no, I actually started undergrad as a nursing uh, major. I was in nursing school for two and a half years in undergrad. Um, and um, I always sort of knew public health was an area I wanted to go into. Um, my mom hates this story, but it's the reason that I'm in public health is in seventh grade in social studies, we watched a, a movie about Ebola. Um, and I immediately fell in love with it. I mean, I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. Like it turns you into a walking zombie. Like this is like, Ebola is just really, really um, and that's not something that like any parent wants to hear a seventh grader say like that's not most people that's a red flag. Um, so I always sort of knew like in going into college I wanted to go into infectious disease nursing. Um, and then as I was in nursing school I realized that nursing just wasn't quite cutting it. Um, I loved um, making people healthier and helping people, but I realized that I was only really helping, you know, my six ish patients um, per shift. Um, and for me, that just wasn't enough. I wanted to be sure I was able to make a, a standing and a lasting impact in the communities that I worked in. Um, and so that really is, is sort of what, what motivated me to move into public health. And um, my undergrad actually was one of, at the time, was one of the few programs that had bachelors of public health. Um, and I was really, really happy to, to be able to be a part of it. Okay, so what what do you think um, doing those first two years in nursing has has done for like your perspective on public health? Like I, I know you just said that you you really didn't think that you were making a a big mm -hmm. as as big as an impact as you you could yeah. have um, approaching problems in a different way instead of like just one on one. So we'll... right. I think it gave me it gives me a lot of a lot of understanding of how clinical processes work. I mean. So I also, and I'm sure we'll get into this later, but I have a background in healthcare and hospital epidemiology. Um, and that's actually what I did at CDC. Um, so it helps me understand during those years, um, and I also worked at a hospital system and still do some consulting with them, but it under, helps me understand the aspects of healthcare, right? So it's like, if a person gets sick, sometimes we see that like, all right, well, if they're sick, like they just have to go to the doctor's office. I'm like, that's it, right? Like. But that's not, there's a whole clinical process that has to happen. You have to understand clinically what does that look like? How does um, something like obesity or diabetes, for example, how does diabetes present itself clinically? We might see 
um, edema of the feet and the leg, we might see um, some yellowing of skin or of nails in some cases. You know, there, there are these signs and these symptoms that we have to also understand how that impacts daily life. Um, so that's a public health perspective. And how do we then incorporate that into public health? Um, and I think for me, those, those first few years of my nursing, um, my nursing program were really fundamental in that understanding that there is a way for us to bridge medicine and public health, because I think often we see them as polar opposites. And like, well, you can't really do both unless like, you know, like you find someone who's really good and they're like, this is my passion. And I think we often polarize the two. Um, and I, I don't think that's fair. So I really do appreciate that part of my educational career and my, uh, even my clinical experience um, in the hospital um, for really helping me understand some of how those systems and those processes so you got your certificate in uh, certificate in nursing aid one from Carolina's mm -hmm. College of Health Sciences. So I'm mm -hmm. guessing you, you got that while you were still planning to become a nurse. Yeah, so I got that uh, after my second going into my third year. Um, so it was uh, some uh, so it's a nursing nurse aid. Um, some places called a nursing assistant, a certified nurse assistant, a healthcare assistant. Um, but it was it was done actually the hospital. Um, in Charlotte, where I grew up, actually had a, a program over the summer, um, and we were required to get it for the program, just for my nursing program. Um, but that also really gave me the experience, and even like when we were doing clinical rounds during that, I got to work in a long-term care facility, um, a rehabilitation facility, as well as on a couple of hospital units that I hadn't previously worked on um, when I was trying to figure out nursing. Um, and it really, it's actually something that like I actually still have it up to date. Um, it's been, I guess, five years now, and I, I still, I still have that active um, because it's important for me to be able to understand um, how that plays a, a role in our care. I mean, and it's even basic skills like it's how to take um, someone's temperature, how to take someone's blood pressure, um, how to bathe someone, how to brush their teeth. All of the basic skills um, that people that people need, and it, it allows you um, really sort of get a grasp and an entry uh, sort of to how healthcare works. Okay. And for, did, did you have a lot of overlap in the courses that you had to take for nursing and public health? Or did you have to like, m like max out your, your semesters after those first two years to try to get your public health degree? So there were a couple um, of classes that actually overlapped. Actually, um, my concentration for my undergrad was a community health education concentration. Um, and it was actually some of those classes were elected for nursing students. Um, so I was able really to like sort of to work on it. And I, I really didn't have to take any, um, I don't think I actually ever had to max out a, a semester while I was uh, switching to public health, um, which I'm really thankful for because that really would have made it a lot more difficult. Um, but it's, it, was, it was a pretty seamless transition. Um, and I think, I think that's pretty indicative of how the two can really work together, um, especially like when we're looking at how practice is. Yeah, absolutely. And and you said that you have like an interest in um, hospital epidemiology. So I can definitely see how that clinical part plays, not not only just because understanding it, but just understanding how the other clinicians think, because right. in public health, it's, it's very interdisciplinary and, and you really have to be able to work and understand and, and know all those things. So the first position I see you had during your undergrad was a contributing writer at Odyssey Online. So what is Odyssey Online and what was that role? So Odyssey Online is an online publication system, magazine, website, not really sure what it was. Um, but essentially what it does is it runs off of um, college students who um, they'll write articles about something and then they'll post it. And then essentially like if you get like the top maybe like one or two like most read articles that week, like you get a bonus, like you get paid for it, whatever. Um, and it was something that a couple of my friends did and I was like, you know what, let's just give this a shot. Um, and I was thinking about uh, it recently and uh, it was something that at the time I didn't really think was valuable. I was like, eh, like I'm really good at writing. Like why not write about like 10 reasons you should care about not littering? Like, you know, it was something that I thought was really silly, but now I look back at it and I think that that really helped me write in a way that is able for the, the lay audience to understand. Um, I think in public health, we really, uh, we really create an automatic disconnect because we like to use a lot of technical terms. We like to say, um, you know, something, you know, we think it's silly, but cardiovascular disease, you know, half of Americans don't know what cardiovascular disease is, uh, but you say heart disease and immediately they're like, oh yeah, I, I have that. You're like, 
cool, I've been saying that for two weeks and you told me you didn't. Um, but it really helped me understand how to communicate uh, really simply and really easily. Um, and it wasn't really something that I appreciated until recently when I really sort of dug into why I took that role and why I thought it was important. But it, it's something I definitely think, especially if you're in academia or you're in research and writing a lot, um, and you haven't really you know, taken a step back and thought about like, how can I make my resources or how can I make my materials a little bit more engaging? Um, it's definitely something I consider, I would consider, honestly recommend um, people to take a stab at. Yeah, and I, and I think that is absolutely true, um, especially in, in public health. Like we have to talk and translate information and most of the time very complex information to many different populations. So yeah. it, is, it is really important to, to be able to break down something to as more like simplest forms. So people can, oh, okay, I, I understand that. Um, right. Yeah, definitely. So you also had a role as an infection prevention student associate at Carolina's mm -hmm. healthcare system, which is now Atrium Health. Uh, mm -hmm. What did you do in this role? Actually, how, how did you get this role and what did you do in it? Okay, so the way I got that role is actually the guy that cut my hair at the time. Um, <laughs> also cut um, the person who was looking for someone to take a job. So it, it happened to be by connecting, um, which I guess really shows the importance of networking and um, all of that fun stuff. But um, so while I was there, it was actually, um, so I, I was originally hired as a, uh, an infection prevention student associate and I got promoted to an infection prevention assistant or associate. They switched the role, but um, that's actually, that was my intro, like sort of my, my real jumping off point on hospital and healthcare epidemiology. Um, so infection prevention or infection um, control, as some places call it, is essentially whenever you're in a hospital, um, any sickness you get while you're in the hospital that is not related to the reason you sort of came in um, is considered a hospital infection. So this might be something like um, if you get a UTI from a catheter, if you get an infection from a central line, um, or um, if you get MRSA in the hospital, all of those are hospital acquired infections. And there's about uh, six or eight of them that, that are really sort of what we monitor. Um, so that really sort of threw me right into epidemiology off the bat. Um, and I absolutely love it. Um, it was one of my, one, easily one of the highlights of my career. I was there um, for a couple of years while I was still an undergrad. Um, and I'm still actually consulting with them some um, through COVID. Um, and I think I was, I was thinking about it too recently is, uh, I was actually there when we did Ebola. So I did Ebola response there, I did Zika response there. Um, and I was able to come out of undergrad having two outbreak responses already under my belt. Um, and I think that that's something that's really unique. And I, I really, I think about it. And I, I, that's a really great experience, you know? Um, so I, I absolutely immediately fell in love with hospital and healthcare epidemiology. And um, it's, a, it's a good mixture. It's a perfect mixture of understanding public health and, and nursing, right? And understanding how things such as, um, you know, there would be um, times where we're like, all right, well, like, how can we make sure that the people that are delivering, delivering the food trays to the, to the patient rooms, how do we make sure that they're staying safe and they're not transmitting something? Or how do we make sure that um, whenever there's, uh, you know, somebody leaves and the environmental services team comes in, how do we make sure that they're cleaning the right way, making sure that they're killing the most germs or the most microbes that they can um, in the most efficient way? Um, and that's also sort of where I learned how you have to fight sort of sometimes in public health or in, in health care um, for your patients. Um, and how to say, you know, there were times where if we, um, it's a weird example, but like we, there was this catheter that came out that was supposed to really reduce infection rates, um, but it was more expensive. So we had to argue with, with providers or with people in the system about like, look, no, like we know that this is gonna be more expensive. Um, but it's also an expense that is worth it because it'll then make sure that our, our patients have better outcomes. They're not going to get infections that could cause your insurance not to reimburse the hospital for um, an infection that they might get. It'll help your numbers. It'll help this. So it really um, sort of taught me how to really advocate um, in almost a business sense um, for our patients and, and for the people we were working with. Because that's not something that like innately comes to people in public health. Like Rarely do I find someone in public health who is like, by implementing this, you know, this needle exchange program, the community is going to save $500,000 over the next two years. Like, that's not something public health thinks about, right? Like, that's sort of on the back end 
but it really gave me the opportunity and the skills to really sort of dig into that and learn how to how to talk to people almost like in a business and in healthcare administration. Yeah, and, and I think that is so important. And you hit it right on the head. Like it is not something the public health thinks about, but I think we need to expand the scope to really think about that. Because as we're saying, like right now, there's a lot of um debate between like health and then economy. And mm-hmm. I think the, the two are both intertwined and we have to be able to to say as public health professionals, okay, this is the best thing for a holistic point of view, you know, not, not just health, but both health and economy and really weigh out those risks. So, so yeah, definitely. And that is awesome that you've gotten those experiences in undergrad. Like <laughs> I had, I had nothing like that. So I'm, I'm jealous, but <laughs> moving along. Um, you are a health educator at uh, university of North Carolina, Wilmington. So uh, what do you do in this position? Yeah, so during, so this was uh, while, like, you know, during, like, the, the academic school year is uh, I was an alcohol and other drug educator for UNCW has this office called Crossroads, um, which is essentially their alcohol and other drugs uh, prevention office. Um, and there, there's two levels of it. One of it is the peer educators. Um, and then the other one um, is, I don't remember the exact name for it, but it's essentially community educators. Um, and I was one of the community educators. So what we did is we went into um, middle school, uh, PE classes, and we would teach a, a series of lessons about alcohol and other drugs and how it um, affected the brain and how it would affect lifestyles and, and that sort of stuff. And it's, it was really, uh, it was an incredible program. Um, and it really was really, really evident, evidence-based. Um, and it was right sort of in North Carolina where I'm from, um, everybody loves the D.A.R.E. program. Um, and we know that D.A.R.E. is a terrible program. It's not well done. Uh, evaluations that they show that it's completely ineffective. Um, so we were able to get this really good, really strong drug education program out into the community in Wilmington. Um, New, Ever- New Hanover County, which is where Wilmington is, uh, has one of the highest rates of opioid use in the nation. Um, and it's Wilmington on its own has about 100,000 people um, and has, so it has one of the highest rates of opioid use. Um, so it was really a, a great time for us to be in the community teaching these, these middle schoolers about alcohol and other drugs and making sure that we would equip them with the decision-making skills. Um, And that's really what we set out to do. Um, We made it really clear that it is not our job to tell you whether to do drugs or not to. It is our job to make sure that you have the skills and the knowledge and the ability to whenever that situation comes that you can then make that decision and be confident in that decision because you're equipped with the tools to do so. Um, And that was something that we really, really prided ourselves in. Um, so it was, it was a really great, really great job. Um, it was with an incredible team. And I think, uh, of that team, three of us are still in public health and the other one is actually a middle school teacher. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was a really awesome team and it, it really, um, middle schoolers are, are savage. Um, like they are some of the meanest pers- people I've ever met in my life. Um, so it was also like, a, I remember like my first day doing it. I like Facebook messaged my seventh grade teacher. And I was like, I am so sorry for however I acted when I was in your class. Middle schoolers are awful, um, but it was, it was cool. I mean, it is also like, you know, you're having to deliver this message uh, to a group of people that probably weren't that receptive. I mean, like, I remember like myself in like middle school PE, like I didn't care if somebody came in and talked to me. I was like, all right, cool. Like, are we going to go play basketball or like, we're just going to sit here and listen to them. Um, so it was, it was a really awesome experience and I'm really glad that I was able to do that and really sort of learn how to reach, uh, populations that don't really care about what you're saying. Um, but it was, it was still one of my favorite positions too. Okay. Well, that's awesome. And it definitely kind of builds off of your contributing writer position where you get to communicate with people and really build that skill, which is, which is awesome. Um, I also, I also saw that you, well, you have your certified health education specialists or CHES. Yeah. So why did you mm-hmm. want to get this? So, uh, I got that, uh, I sat for that in, uh, April of 2017. I graduated May of 2017. So we sat right before we graduated. Um, and my undergrad program at UNC Wilmington was one of the few that qualified you out of your bachelor's to sit for your CHES. Um, And I knew sort of that I wanted to make sure that uh, I had that credential. Essentially, I was able to back up that I have these skills. Um, Chez is the industry industry standard um, and really anything um, health education related. Um, 
And I wanted to make sure that I was able to prove that I had these abilities and that I could, I could do it, that I was a health educator that knew what he was doing. Um, and I think too is, is it was also, when I graduated, it was also sort of a turning point in public health in general, because you did start having people with bachelor's degrees coming out saying, we have these skills, we learn these skills, um, like give us jobs, right? Like we are qualified, give us jobs. And that's not something that we really saw a lot of before, uh, I would even say like 2015, 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm. um, so me, you know, coming right out of undergrad, I wanted to make sure that I had um, the credentials um, to back up that I knew what I was doing. Um, and I remember like in my first, one of my first classes at Rollins, uh, one of our faculty members, he was like, you know, this, uh, this class will help you uh, prepare for your CHES exam. Who in here has your CHES? And I was the only one to raise my hand. And I was like, all right, cool. Like I, I do kind of know what I'm doing. Like I am in the right spot, like this is good. So I really, uh, if someone has the opportunity to take their CHES, I highly recommend it. Um, it's, especially if you have a background in public health, if you have uh, public health degrees that qualify you for it. Um, I definitely, I definitely recommend it. Um, and it's, it's, it's good. It gives you a, a good overview of stuff. And I think that that's really what's important because it, it allows you to think of uh, how to implement health programs in, in ways that might not always be your first choice. You might not think of at first, but you're like, wait, no, this does make sense because it's about putting your community first before, before yourself. Uh, so I highly recommend it. It's one of my, uh, one of my certifications that I, I'm really proud of. Um, especially getting it, you know, right out of undergrad, uh, that sort of, you know, added a little bit of credibility to me. You know, and it, it, I, I really am proud of it. Yeah, that, that definitely is awesome. And yeah, like I haven't heard one person regret getting their chairs. So, so I would recommend it a hundred percent. Um, yeah, I, I kind of wish it was something that I did, but I'm okay right now, not getting my yeah. chairs. But, but if you if I do, get, it, I, you're still I, time. I know if I do get a certification, I th definitely think it's going to be my chairs next. <laughs> awesome. So you had one more position before you moved to um, Rollins. Um, yeah. so this was a HIV STI outreach coordinator slash health educator. Uh, how did you get this position? Where was it? And what did you do? Yeah, so it was at uh, the New Hanover County Health Department uh, in Wilmington. So it was actually my, uh, my internship that I had to do at Wilmington. Um, so if you're part of, a, I mean, if you're part of NEC, the credit program, you have to do an applied experience. Um, and this was actually, um, uh, it was actually a full-time position during that internship. Um, so I was there, you know, 40 hours a week over, you know, it was, it was the, the best intro to community health you could get. Um, and HIV and STIs are really something that another one of my areas that I'm really passionate about, um, because I think that they're especially when it comes to understanding how communities work. Um, I think there's often a lot of areas that we overlook when it comes to HIV and STI. Um, so like, for example, in this position, we did testing in prisons and prisons and jails. Um, and that's my favorite experience that I've ever had in public health. Uh, we would do it uh, every other Tuesday of the month. And it was something that I think I might have missed once because I was sick. Um, like, it's just the absolute best experience because it really helps you understand um, from a baseline how public health works. Um, recently um, at the CDC Rollins um, orientation day, uh, the chief health officer, Dr. Angela uh, Jeter from Atlanta um, said, if you wanna intro to public health, go work at your health, your local health department. Um, and I mean, she nailed that on the head um, because it is the ultimate experience for, for people in public health. It helps you understand what public health looks like on the ground. Um, it helps you understand really how um, your community works, how your community views health, um, and then sort of really just throws you into the fire, more or less. Um, but the, we, that was an incredible uh, position, and we, we really we did the first LGBT health fair um, in this, uh, Southeast North Carolina, something called Healing Within, or Healing, Healing Within Health. Um, and... It was really, it was a really cool experience for for southern, for southeastern North Carolina because that's not somewhere that uh, has a, a big uh, LGBTQ population. Um, but we were able to bring resources to them. We were able to, um, we really wanted to make sure that we weren't only bringing health resources, but we were bringing uh, AARP was there, um, Sage was there, which is um, a part of AARP, but focusing on um, 
elder LGBTQ people. We wanted to make sure that um, community outreach groups were there, that it wasn't just centered around what health looks like. Um, because when someone comes to the health department at a local level, um, they might be coming in just for an STI screen, but I guarantee you the minute that you start asking um, about their history and about you know gathering your basic information about them, you're really gonna uncover that there's a lot of social needs that they have, a lot of barriers and a lot of inequities that they're facing in their communities. Um, and our local health departments are the first ones that are able to address those. Um, you know, they're the first ones that are able to identify those. And then um, if it's something that can be addressed through legislation, they can, you know, walk across the street or walk up a couple of stairs um, to someone who works on policy and say, look, we've noticed this with 100 of our patients are noticing that there's no, um, there's no fresh food on this block. How do we zone this? What can we do? How can we create this? Um, so that's also another thing that I really suggest is that um, I think anyone in public health needs to spend time at a local health department, um, no matter where. Um, I mean, given like New York City health department is going to look like a little bit different um, than, you know, Wilmington, North Carolina. But I think it's, it's such an incredible experience um, and really gives you the understanding of what public health looks like on a local level uh, to work at a health department. Yeah, and yeah, I, I agree. I, I didn't work in a health department directly, but I worked with an organization that did a lot of work with health departments. So I was in the health department a lot. Um, yeah. And, and I, de I definitely really advocate for that, like getting that community-based work and really working with the community to, to get used to that kind of experience. Because as public health professionals, you could get distant, but it, it is really about meeting those communities where they're at yeah. and, and then going forward with them from that point. So, so thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and I think too, and it's, we always joked about it, but it also like, it's also like a really good way to learn how to like work without like a ton of resources or a ton of support, right? Like, uh, I think now we're seeing this more than ever is that local health departments are historically underfunded substantially, um, you know, and it, it's a lot of like, you want a flyer made for your event, make it on your own, or like you want, you know, a lot of, of ways to understand how to be resourceful, especially when it comes to to doing community programs or, or doing community outreach. So I think that that was another really cool thing that like, uh, it really, really taught me how underfunded uh, public health is, but it's, it's the reality of it, you know? And it, I think we're now unfortunately seeing that more than ever um, because of how we're having to respond to COVID. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I completely agree. Public health is way, way too much underfunded. And uh, hopefully during <clears throat> this entire COVID like pandemic, I guess I hope the light the light shine shines and um, yeah. we do get some more funding coming coming um, from the other side sometime soon. Yeah. So you did your uh, master's of public health at Emory mm -hmm. University. So mm -hmm. uh, did you want to do this? Like, did you think about doing your MPH in your bachelor's, or was it something that like how how did how did the thought of doing your MPH come about? I should ask. So I when I wanted to be a nurse, I wanted to be a nurse epidemiologist. Um, so I always sort of knew that I had to get an MPH one way or another. Um, and it was one of those things where it was like, you know, going into my senior year at Wilmington, I was like, I think an MPH is just what feels right. Like I never really thought about applying to jobs um, because I was like, you know, I just, I just know that I want to get an MPH. I know that, that I want that experience. Um, and I know that that's really going to sort of help me further understand where I want to be in public health. Um, you know, because coming out of undergrad, I was like, well, I like this thing and I like this thing and I like this thing. And then you have like a bucket of 12 things that you like, and you're like, wait, I don't, it's, it's tough to tie all of those together. Um, so I, I really knew sort of that I wanted to do an in page from the get go. And I, I had a lot of incredible advisors, uh, George Figueroa, Dr. Hannah Catalano, or Dr. George Figueroa, Hannah Catalano, um, Dr. Carrie Whipple at UNCW, who all really talked me through it. Um, and, and sort of told me what to look for in programs. Um, because I think sometimes, like, especially if it's something that you have, don't have an undergrad in or don't have experience in, um, depending where you are in your public health career, you're like, oof, that MPH is making me take like eight stats courses. Like, absolutely not. But that's also good. That's what you need. Um, that's a challenge that will help you grow as a public health practitioner. Um, so I sort of always knew that I was, I was going to be in the ballpark for an MPH. And uh, I'm thankful that I ended up at, at, at Emory. Yeah. So what, what made you choose Emory? 
Um, so I actually, uh, my grandmother actually got her master's from Emory. Uh, she was in either the first or the second class of women that were allowed at Emory um, in the graduate school. Um, so I'd always sort of heard of Emory. I'd sort of known what it was. Like, it's just like that school in Atlanta. Like, it's got like some cool marble buildings, but I like, didn't know much else about that. Um, and it actually, uh, I applied to it on a complete whim. Um, I applied to a bunch of schools. Um, I think I applied to 17 actually. Uh, and I just threw the net as far as I could and just picked up anything that I could. Um, and I actually, I applied to Georgia Southern and was actually touring Georgia Southern when I got the email that I was accepted into Emory. Um, and I like looked at my phone and I like turned to my mom and I was like, mom, I got into Emory. And she's like, what? I was like, I got into Emory. And we were like, all right, like just finish out this, like finish out the tour <laughs> and just like, just get out of it. And, like, we'll be fine. Um, but Emory has an incredible way of making sure that, that the, the people in the School of Public Health are, feel like family. Um, I mean, from Miss Pam, who is everyone's favorite coffee person um, in the cafe, to um, Joanne and student engagement, to, you know, to the Dean, Dean Curran, um, we all feel like family and we're all seen as colleagues. Um, and I think that that was really important. Like, I don't know of a faculty member um, at Rollins that told me to call them doctor, whatever. It was always a first name basis. Um, and immediately you felt that, that, that feeling and that connection because we're all there, um, especially at Emory, um, to become better, to, to learn. And you're with a bunch of other really, really smart and accomplished people. Um, and it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't hurt that you're also across the street from CDC. Um, and, and to me, that was also a really important thing because I'd always wanted to do uh, work at CDC. I wanted to do outbreak response at CDC. So for me, that was another really big draw to Emory. Um, but above everything else was that sense of community and that sense of learning that like, you never had to go through any part of the program alone. There was always somebody there and there was always um, somebody in your corner cheering for you, whether it be, uh, like I remember I had a family emergency and I told um, my, the academic advisor, and she sent an email out. She sent an email out to all my faculty members. Um, and then I got, within 20 minutes, I got a call from um, the director of student life for the School of Public Health, like saying like, what do you need? What can we do to help? Like, what, like what's going on? What resources do you need? And I think that that's something that's really, really special. Um, and it's, I can't say enough thing, good things about Rollins and about Emory. I absolutely love it. Um, but it's a, it's a really special place. And I think it's also like, I never thought I would get into Emory. Um, like I never, I applied to it just to apply to it. Um, I, I didn't think I would get in. Um, but they also do, and, and Rollins is really adamant about this, is they do a holistic application. Um, so they don't just look at your grades. And my SATs were all, or not my SATs, my GREs uh, were terrible. Um, like it didn't even allow me to uh, apply to some schools. Um, because they were so bad. Like I'm talking like less than 50 percentile. Like they were just trash. Um, but Rollins also dug into my my resume and they saw that I did have other experiences that would be probably more valuable than if I can figure out the area of a triangle that's like eight sided, right? Like so that's something that that a lot of schools now are, are starting to head, head up. But Rollins really. Uh, took that on from the beginning. And that's something I think too really speaks to the character of the school and the character of the people that they look for. Um, but yeah, I mean, I absolutely adore Rollins. I, I could talk about it for days, but, but uh, I won't put you through that yet. <laughs> maybe, maybe another time we can definitely talk about it. But I've, I've interviewed a couple of people that, that uh, went to Emory uh, Rollins School of Public Health and they, they also have just great things to say. So I'm, I'm definitely, I want to interview someone at that school to just talk about the program. So that will be coming soon, everyone. But de I, de I definitely think that your, your chairs is something that definitely sets you apart also. Yeah. But, but yeah, I'm glad that a lot of public health schools are moving towards that holistic application and not looking at just your GRE or your standardized test scores because it, it really doesn't say much to, to anything. And I, I got really bad GRE scores too. So, so I, yeah. I definitely feel that. Well, I think it's important too to say like, you know, there are some programs, like I believe University of Michigan actually got rid of their GRE requirement this mm -hmm. past cycle. Um, and I think that's something too, like I remember uh, Dr. Natalie Crawford at Rollins uh, in one of her classes, we evaluated uh, data on if GREs are successful predictors of, of academic outcomes. Um, and they're not, surprise. 
Um, you know, but I think it's too is, you know, the fact that we were also able to do that type of analysis in a class and sort of be like, this is also why we made this decision because like this is the data to show that like, it, it doesn't, doesn't say anything really about you. Um, so I do also think that that's um, something, especially with schools of public health, that, that they are starting to do and it's something that I'm really, really happy that they're doing. Yeah, and, and that is awesome. So you had a role as a consultant at Barker mm -hmm. by Coastal Health Consultants. So mm -hmm. what is that and what did you do? And before, before that, what, what is your, did you have a concentration at Emory? So I was behavioral science and health education okay. um, while I was there. So I was a BSHU um, and they've now changed the name again. Um, I think it's the third iteration of the name since I graduated. So they're just really encompassing it all, but it's, just, it's the exact same classes. They're just adding letters at this point. Um, but so while I was with um, Barker by Coastal, um, we, we worked with a, 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 a research study that was going on at Emory. Um, so we worked on the vape study with Dr. Carla Berg. Um, and that was actually a re another really cool role is, is in that study, uh, we traveled to Seattle, San Diego, Atlanta, Oklahoma City, Minneapolis, and Boston um, to understand vape shops and understand um, talk with some vape shop owners, do point of sale purchases, um, and do just like some interviews and just understand sort of what vape shops look like in these different areas. And um, in uh, Massachusetts, so in Boston, it was, uh, they switched the age to 21 up the month uh, before, month after we were there. Um, and then we know like California and Washington State are doing their own thing when it comes to regulating um, e-cigarettes and, and tobacco devices in general. Um, so it was, it was a really cool position and it, it was, a, a, it was a, a way for us to sort of talk through and understand what vape shops and what regulations among tobacco look like. Um, so it was, it was sort of like a research assistant position, um, but it, it's classified as a consultant. Um, so it was, it was a really cool experience and it was something that um, really let us sort of dig in uh, to at that time, you know, vapes were still really popping up everywhere. I mean, vape shops were, were everywhere. Um, I mean, we're talking um, hundreds per city. Um, so it, it was also really cool, like, to travel and get paid to travel to, you know, I did Seattle, Minneapolis, and San Diego. So you could travel, you get paid to travel to those places, and you get to explore the city, and you get to see, um, you know, parts of the city where there's vape shops. You're like, wait, this is a really cool, like, artsy part of the city, or this is a really cool, um, suburb of the city that I wouldn't have gone to if I just like came out here to hang out with some friends, but uh, it was a really cool position. And I think it's, uh, it really sort of uh, gave, gave me also a really good understanding of social and behavioral epidemiology, especially when it comes to understanding tobacco use, uh, which I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about uh, in a bit, but it was, it was a really cool position and we had an incredible team there um, and we've all ended up all over the place. Uh, I think there were eight of us, um, six of us. Um, but uh, I, was, I was really, really lucky to work with those incredible, uh, incredible uh, people in my cohort during that time and, and get to travel with them, which was, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, that, that definitely sounds like an awesome uh, time and great experience. Yeah. And, and you get to just check out some, some new places, which is always a plus, you know. Um, yeah. So you had a research assistant position at the CDC. Um, mm -hmm. So how did you get this position and like what, what kind of stuff did you do in it? Yeah, so I was um, on the hospital, hospital infection prevention team um, in the Division of Healthcare Quality and Promotion. Um, yeah, I think I, yeah. Um, and so I actually got that uh, partially through Emory. So Emory has this thing called Rollins Earn and Learn for Rollins students. Um, and they have partnerships with a bunch of uh, organizations, uh, whether it be CDC, Emory, uh, Emory Healthcare, um, ICF, uh, I mean, just a ton of organizations um, to, um, to essentially have like this group of students that like um, are, are looking for jobs and, and are sort of like, there's a, a mutual agreement between uh, Rollins and the organization. Um, and so that's how I found that position. And um, it was doing hospital and healthcare epidemiology. I already had a background in that and I loved that. Um, and I was like, I get to do, I get to support outbreak response at CDC doing hospital and healthcare epidemiology. Like this is the ideal situation. Um, and it was incredible. It was, it's, it was really, it was really cool. And we, um, 
worked a lot with uh, states and with hospitals on understanding the burden of um, hospital acquired infection um, or HAIs um, and understanding and working with facilities to understand where their gaps were. Um, so we would do things like surveys with facilities and they would give us uh, staff surveys and we'd say, well, we noticed that, you know, 25% of your uh, patient techs are saying that they wash their hands every time, um, but your nurses are saying only like 17%. So where is there a gap here? How do we fix this gap? Um, and then how does this also compare to what your numbers and what your rates for these HAIs are looking like? Um, and I was there for almost two years. Um, and it was, it, was, it was just awesome. I mean, I can't, it was just like my dream job. We, we responded to outbreaks. We worked on um, hospital acquired infections. We got to work with a lot of different people at CDC. Uh, we had two government shutdowns during that time. Um, and it also, you know, it was a very sharp contrast to the position that I had, you know, four months earlier at a local health department. Um, where they were like, you have free range to do whatever you want to, just make sure like the community is healthy. And then at CDC, that is not the case. Um, but it, it gave me a really good understanding of how CDC works. Um, it gave me, we wrote policy, some policy while we were there, some recommendations, I guess we wrote recommendations while we were there. Um, we worked with a lot of other government agencies like Center for Medicare, Medicaid. Um, and so it gave me a really cool lens on you know, I'd always heard too, like when I was working at the hospital system, we would put all our data um, into um, this database at CDC um, and then NHSN, which is now part of what was moved up to DHS um, or DHHS uh, recently, which is a whole nother thing. But while I was at, you know, the hospital, uh, we, would, we would input our data in this and then I got to CDC and my team was responsible for analyzing that data. Um, so it sort of came full circle in that aspect. And, it was really cool too to understand like when we had these initiatives when I was at the hospital working in um, Epi versus like what did that what was the reasoning behind that it came from the CDC um, so how, like how did those fit together and it, it gave you that complete picture um, and it you know NHSN which is also where the COVID um, data from hospitals was originally stored um, was recently taken away from CDC. Um, and moved up to DHI, um, health, and, health and Human Services. Um, but, and I think a lot of us too is, this is gonna be a little tiny detour, but I think it's really important um, because I think a lot of us don't understand the importance of NHSN and that reporting. Um, because NHSN is not a perfect system. Uh, it's complicated, it's, but it's also very secure. Uh, it's non-biased, um, and the data is really, really helpful. Um, so whenever that data was moved from CDC um, to Health and Human Services, what that did uh, was take away the CDC's ability to understand and analyze that data on a hospital level. Um, and that also, your hospitals also sort of speak for your communities. Um, you know, so that's a, a detrimental move. Um, to move NHSN from CDC. And I think that that's something that sort of got pushed under the rug unless you were in that sphere at that time. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a devastating move because it, it really does uh, sort of get rid of transparency when it comes to that data. Um, and we, don't, we now don't really know what that data looks like. You know, and it's also, there's also like, I have some skin in that game because some of that, you know, was what I was working on when I was there. Uh, but it's also really important just for, for public health in general to understand that that is a detrimental move um, to getting clean and reliable data. Yeah, and, and thank you for sharing that. And, and that is so true. I feel like there's, there's been a lot of things that have been happening under the rug, um, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, thank you for sharing that. That, that is very yeah. illuminating. So um, I know we didn't talk about this a lot, but throughout both your undergrad and graduate, you were involved in a lot of different student organizations. Mm -hmm. How did this shape your view of public health, if at all? Yeah, so um, I was in a couple. In undergrad, I, was, uh, I got inducted in Eta Sigma Gamma, which is the, health honorary, or the Honorary Society for Health Educators. Um, and that was a, a really cool sort of uh, thing to be in because it... Um, it sort of gave you a, a perspective sort of across uh, the US about what other health educators were doing, um, especially what other 
um, people that you know had just graduated undergrad or are still an undergrad, what their health education programs look like. Um, and they actually have a, a journal for students that are still um, in undergrad uh, for them to publish in, uh, which is really, really cool because it's, um, you know, a lot of times the first introduction into publishing, if that's important to you. Um, but that's also, it was a really great resource. Um, during, at Emory, um, I was a ambassador um, as well as I was the president of the Rollins, Rollins Queer Trans Collaborative, uh, which is the LGBTQ uh, group at Rollins. Um, and that was a really, really awesome um, experience because uh, the year I was president, we really dug into understanding what intersectionality meant and what it looked like at Rollins. Um, because it was something like, you know, you would throw intersectionality around in class, like when talking about stuff. Uh, but a lot of student organizations weren't really working together and understanding that. Um, we had a, a, um, um, a program with um, the Students for Social Justice at, at Rollins, which is an incredible student-led group um, with um, two individuals who um, were uh, originally from Russia um, and who had to came, come to the US because they were uh, essentially exiled from Russia because of their sexuality. Um, and understanding sort of, well, how does that fit into social justice as well as um, identifying as an LGBTQ individual? So where do these intersect? Um, we also did like a lot of other collaborations with other organizations like um, the, I don't remember the specific names for them, but um, with a lot of the other organizations, we were able to sort of dig into what intersectionality looks like and how um, different identities look when it comes to health. Um, if you are, for example, if you're a black trans woman, um, your life expectancy is like 32 to 34. Um, so how do we understand that coming from um, someone who is uh, a trans woman and black? So those intersect and then how can we as two organizations find ways for resources or how can we find ways to speak to that or have someone from the community speak to that? Um, so for me, that was a really big learning experience because we we're able to really dig into intersectionality while I was um, at Rollins in um, the Career Trans Collaborative. And I think it was, uh, it was really meaningful. And I think we got, we got a lot done, um, but that's also not the point of a sort of student organization, especially in grad school is, um, you know, it's cool to get a lot done, but like, is it meaningful? Uh, did it make a difference in your community? Did it um, make the students feel welcomed and feel heard? Because um, you can do as much as you want. You can have, you know, three events each week, but if, you know, if they're pointless, then, then what's, there's no use in having them. Um, so I think a lot of those involvements, uh, both in undergrad and in grad school really, uh, at Emory, uh, really sort of helped me understand a lot of sort of the background of public health, more or less. Okay. Yeah. And th thank you for sharing that. I think that that is very important. And it, it's not something I hear talk, talking about a lot in public health, the intersectionality, but I, I definitely have to dive Dig, dive a little deeper into that and really understand that for myself. So I appreciate you bringing that up. So, so after that, well, after your MPH, you, well, you recently, well, semi-recently, a year ago, um, started your doctorate or PhD in health promotion and behavior at Georgia State, Georgia School, Georgia State School of Public Health. So mm -hmm. was it something like during your MPH that you were like, okay, yes, I've, I've done, I've done my bachelor's in public health. I've done my master's of public health. I want to do my PhD or what was that thought process like? Yeah. So I sort of in the back of my head, I always sort of thought that I want to get a PhD. Mm -hmm. um, and it just sort of felt right. Um, you know, it's one of those things that, like you probably shouldn't just like make that decision based on like your gut feeling. Like there probably should be like a little bit more thought process. Um, but it was one of those things where it was like, I just, I know I want to do this. Um, so let's just, let's just do it. Um, and I was lucky enough it's, um, to end up at Georgia State University um, in a, an incredible program. Um, it's a, a very, uh, it's a, they actually also have bachelor's, master's, and um, two different doctoral programs. Um, and it's a really great place. It, it's really, it's in the middle of downtown Atlanta. Um, it's got an incredible community outreach program. Um, and it really, it really is, is the way for you to understand sort of how, um, how, how it, Atlanta is and how Atlanta looks. Um, because uh, Georgia State pulls people from all, all corners of Georgia. 
um, all corners of the world. Um, and it really, really shows you sort of what that looks like. And for me, that was really important when I was looking at PhD programs um, because I wanted a place that would give me hands-on public health experience um, that wasn't sort of in an ivory tower. Um, I wanted to work in communities. I wanted to, to make sure that these communities I was working with, um, that um, they were the ones who were leading these, these projects. They were the ones that were, you know, making the shots and making the decisions for their community um, and that I was there to, you know, to collaborate with them. But it, you know, at the end of the day, it, it shouldn't be about my research project. Um, it's, it's their project and I'm there to help. Um, so that was really, really important for me when looking at PhD programs is I wanted to make sure I was, I was in the heart of a city. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I was uh, in the community. Um, and I wanted to make sure that the communities were going to be the ones that were leading uh, the collaborations I was on. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, I, I, I love that. Um, I love working in the community and really, because I, I think t for, for too long as researchers, as scientists, we have burden communities with what we want to do instead of meeting them where they're at and asking them and really working with them to let them direct the research. Because if we're doing research, more than likely we're just going to up, up and go after the research. But right. when you really have a community member, a community leader that you are working with throughout these projects, it really ingrains them and, and makes them makes it part of part for them you know and, and they feel like it's their project when it is their project and right. and it i think it's just it's just so important and i think community-based participatory research and and any involvement of community is just so important for public health and and i'm really glad that you say that as a phd student i, yeah. I feel like because a lot of people kind of lose that when they when they go for their phds so so i really appreciate that and i'm glad that georgia state does that for you yeah, so I think it's I think it's something that we're also like a lot of times in public health. That's something that we're just like, oh, this community needs help. Like I'm the one to do it. And you're like, ooh, no, you're not. Like, you know, like it. it I think it's something that a lot of public health has to think about, unfortunately. And they, it's something that there's definitely a room for growth in the field of public health, uh, because like we're all eager to make sure that people are healthier and happier. But also like, it's not our decision, right? It, it's the communities. It's, you know, it's where they live, it's where they work, it's where they worship, grow, have their families. Um, so ultimately it is their decision. It is their decision on, um, you know, how they want to, if you want to implement a, you know, a healthy cooking session, um, work with that community to understand how they cook. Um, you know, you can't, you know, instead of, you know, fried chicken, it's okay to bake it, you know, but you don't want to say, look, there's no, you know, there's no, uh, ability for you to fry any types of food, especially in the South where a lot of that experience that I have is, um, especially, you know, I remember there was one program I worked on and somebody suggested that you get rid of uh, church lunches after, uh, Sunday lunches after church. Um, and in the South, that's a, that's a, I mean, you don't, you don't get rid of church lunches. Um, that's, that's just how it is. Um, and I think that that for me was a really eye-opening part of it too, is being like, wait, like this community, if we do that, like they're not going to listen to us. Um, but it's also not what the community wants. It's important to them to have that time together on Sundays after service to, to talk about their week, to talk about their upcoming week, to, to see each other because they might not during the week because of work and family. Um, so it's important for us really to remember that the community should be at the heart of everything we're doing, uh, sort of regardless of what, what our own aims and objectives are, uh, especially when we're looking at interventions. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, I absolutely agree with that. Um, so you are you are currently a Second Century Initiative Fellow. What mm -hmm. what is this? <laughs> yeah, so Georgia State had um, so their first uh, sort of they had a, a couple of series of um, programs to bring in um, for faculty. They're just called Second Century Initiative Scholars, I believe. Second Century Initiative Scholars, um, and these are faculty that they bring in that are that are well established or very much on their way to becoming well established in their field and mm -hmm. um, it's a way sort of for them to help boost uh, not boost but create a a, a broader research area um, and uh, so my uh, advisor dr lucy popova um, is a second international initiative scholar um, and then i was brought in as a fellow um, underneath her um, to, to actually i'm into back language science um, which is something I didn't think I would ever be in. Um, but 
Um, so it's it, part of it is, is to make sure that I can become my own independent practitioner and researcher, um, but also that I'm working to help build um, sort of a scholarly uh, foundation um, with Georgia State. Um, and it, it's really, it was a, it's a really incredible program um, because it, it, it really is focusing on getting that research out and getting good research out um, and getting research out that, that helps communities and helps um, make data-driven decisions and inform policies. Um, so it's, uh, and they've, current, they've recently started a new program, I believe it's called the Next Generation, um, which I believe they're bringing on more faculty soon under that, but it, it's, uh, it's a way for them to bring in uh, faculty and fellows um, to, to sort of broaden a research base and to help people conduct research that they want to do um, and do it in, in an environment where they're supported um, and they have the resources to do so. Okay, so it's kind of like technical assistance in a, in a sort of way? Uh, kind of. It's, um, it's more like just like a, a research. I mean, it's a research fellowship. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, we're also like, it's a, still a weird gray area, you know, like, our, like we still don't know if like we're staff members or not. Like, I think we're staff. We're all pretty sure we're staff members, um, but like we're not a hundred percent sure still. Um, so we're we're still in a gray area as well. But it's it's a really awesome program because like it it really does uh, sort of help you. Uh, I mean, it helps you conduct research. It helps you do the research you want to do, um, which is which is unique, especially in, in PhD programs. Okay, awesome. And is the fellowship only open to uh, PhD students or is it open to like MPH and bachelor students also? It's only open to PhD students. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so what is your most and least exciting part of this role? Um, I would say uh, my most exciting um, is uh, probably working in the field, mm -hmm. uh, we, whether it be like site visits or, or interviews. Um, I really love being in the field. Um, I hate just like sitting in my office and just working. Like it's, that's not fun for me. Um, so that's easily my, the most exciting part of my role. Uh, that and probably also the, the research we get to publish. Because we're, we're really, my faculty does a really incredible job of making sure that uh, the fellows and uh, even the master students that we have are, are on papers. Um, and sort of tailoring that to also like what our career goals are. Um, because I think a lot of times um, senior faculty will be like, thanks for your help. Um, we will put like a little note in the contributor section, but like your name's not on this paper. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that like my team would never consider that. Um, and I'm really thankful for that. I think that's really, really incredible that they are so focused on making sure that we are involved on papers um, and that our names are on these papers and that we get a lead paper, that we get a second or last paper. Um, my least favorite part of the role, um, Hmm. I think understanding policy, um, especially like when it comes to FDA policy, um, can get really confusing um, and can get very like legal jargony. And like you have to like sort of take a step back and be like, all right, so like I think they're saying this and then you like go ask three other people and they're like, no, they're saying this and no one has the same answer. Um, and then like finally just like all this email, you know, our contact at FDA and they'll, you know, tell me what it is. Um, but I think that's definitely been one of the tougher things for me is like understanding how uh, policy, especially when it comes to regulations, um, what it looks like. Because um, it's one thing to have policy that's um, like public facing and very public facing um, versus like sort of what all the wheels are policy wise behind that um, before you even get to uh, that, that basic outlier policy. Um, that basic outside uh, sort of like forward facing policy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So yeah. b before we, we jump into the Furious Five, I have three questions, well, three, I guess, topic areas, yeah. if, if, if not three questions. Uh, the first one being, so you, you work for um, the health subcommittee, mem you're a health subcommittee member for the city of Atlanta, mayor's mm -hmm. LGBT, LGBT advisory board. So how mm -hmm. did you get this position and then what do you do in it? Yeah, so one of my, my close friends um, is, uh, well, also back as well. I'm also on the Fulton County uh, HIV Policy Advocacy and Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a weird name. We've never actually called it the whole name. Um, but what that was is that was a, a 
advisory board set up by the Fulton County Board of Commissioners um, to sort of address uh, HIV um, in Fulton County from um, whether it be access to care to uh, making sure people have the, their basic needs and resources met um, to understanding how care can be more efficient um, and then how can uh, the, the county and the board of commissioners then support that. Um, and it, it eventually rolled into us helping uh, write the end, academic, end epidemic plan for, um, for, for Fulton County as well as some of the surrounding counties. Um, but so I, I was on that committee as the scribe and I was you know, there and uh, one of my friends is uh, the LGBT uh, liaison for uh, the mayor, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms at the city of Atlanta. And he was like, Robert, I, I know you're on this other you know, advisory committee. Um, I know that you're in public health, that you're, you're involved in the community. We have this working subcommittee right now that needs someone to help through it. Um, and you know, we need someone who, who knows what the city of Atlanta needs when it comes to help, um, especially on, on the, the ground. Um, and it really is, it's a, we actually haven't met in a couple of months because COVID has been happening. Um, so it's, it's been a while, um, but it's, it's one of those things that it's something that the, the mayor really listens to her advisory board. Um, and um, like I said, I, I was a working subcommittee member there, but still recommendations that we had, she still heard them and she responded to them. Um, whether it be something such as um, housing, um, when it came to the Ryan White program, when it came to um, you know, access for PrEP, um, all of these things, we had talked about it and she heard them and she valued them and she valued our input. Um, so it was, it was really cool. And it's also, you know, a way to be involved in local government um, without like having to be head first in local government. Um, and it, it was really cool. It's, it's an incredible advisory board. And, and the fact that the mayor also has a whole advisory board of people um, from different backgrounds um, talking about, you know, various areas of interest uh, for the LGBT community is a really special thing that Atlanta has. All right, if you don't mind, can you share the importance of like the uh, advocacy for LGBTQ communities um, as, as a public health professional? Absolutely. I think it's uh, the LGBTQ communities in public health have been stigmatized essentially from day one. Um, I mean, there have never been a time that they have been on top of anything. Um, so it's, it's really important. And that's also part of why at the beginning of this, I said that I am an openly gay man in public health because that has to be said. Um, we have to have that because um, there's a lot of stigmas about um, when it comes to public health and LGBT people, especially LGBT men, um, what their health looks like. And we all know that that started around uh, in the early 80s with Ronald Reagan and HIV. Um, off the bat, he set gay men up for nothing but failure when it came to sexual health. Um, and so part of it, part of our advocacy is us trying to advance health. But it's also us trying to make up for that time where for so long that LGBTQ individuals were seen as not healthy or seen as sick, um, which isn't true, um, which isn't also isn't conducive for us to have healthier communities in general. Um, but it's also not because of the LGBTQ community, it's because of the barriers and the inequities and the policies that have been put in place in order for LGBT, LGBTQ individuals um, especially trans individuals, especially non-binary individuals, especially LGBTQ um, persons of color, um, that there are also policies that are put in place intentionally to make sure that they don't have equal health care access, that they don't have access to food, water, housing. Um, so we do have a, a, an obligation as public health professionals, especially as public health professionals that have platforms and voices um, and um, to discuss it, but also to bring these individuals that are marginalized intentionally to the table to speak for themselves. Um, and that's one thing too that the advisory board does a really great job with, um, is that, you know, I am not able to speak to the experiences of a black trans woman that might be HIV positive, or is, um, you know, is struggling with homelessness. I don't have those experiences. I can't talk about what they need about their experiences. I can, however, say, this is my friend. She's gonna be coming with us to the next meeting and she's gonna discuss what her community feels like they need and what they deserve um, as basic resources. So it is really important for us to advocate for LGBTQ individuals and to make sure that we're advocating for all LGBTQ individuals 
um, not just ones that we identify as, that we our friends are, that we work with, um, because you know it's it's an area that we're already set back incredibly. Um, we're set back so much. Uh, so it's if we don't advocate for ourselves, uh, I promise you, nobody else will. Yeah, and, and thank you. I, I really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm glad that you're doing that. And it is just so important to get all these voices to the table because you're not going to solve health for everyone if you don't know what is affecting people. So you definitely need right. to get these, these voices and all these diverse voices to the table. So I appreciate that a lot. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So you had a, well, you currently, I think you're currently still in this role as a deputy team yeah. lead contact tracing data quality in case interviews yeah. um, <laughs> physician, <laughs> quite a mouthful. Um, what yeah. do you do in this position? Yeah, so this is for the, um, so this is for COVID response uh, for the Department of Public Health uh, for Georgia. And I'm actually uh, at Fulton County Board of Health in this role. Um, so I lead a, a team of contact tracers, data quality people and case interviewers. Um, to, to help us figure out sort of what's going on with COVID in, in Fulton County. Um, this includes, you know, following up in cases, giving results, um, data analysis, um, as well as, you know, training more people um, and sort of uh, giving recommendations on, on uh, or gui giving guidance, excuse me, on, you know, if you're testing positive, this is what you want to do. Um, this also, I'm in charge of uh, hospital and healthcare outbreaks. Uh, as well as jail and prison outbreaks. Um, so whenever we have cases there, they, they come to me and I help communicate them with our epidemiologists and sort of figure out what our next steps are. Um, and, you know, contact people and say, look, this is the guidance we have for an outbreak in a jail. Um, these are the recommendations that the Department of Public Health put out. Um, and then how can we make sure that it's not going to spread further in this jail or in this hospital or if there's an exposure? Um, so it, it really, too, is uh, as a social and behavioral epidemiologist, I didn't think this early in my career, uh, I'd be dealing with a pandemic. Um, I don't think anybody did, um, but it also, it, it puts me back at, you know, the, the absolute foundation of what epidemiology is. Um, I mean, these are your most basic forms of, I mean, contact tracing is, is the footwork of epidemiology. It's how you understand how it moves, how social networks move. Um, so it, it's given me that, that ability really to understand what the foundation of epidemiology is, because as we progress in our academic or professional careers, uh, we lose sort of, you know, what the foundations are and whatever we're doing. Um, and I think it also, it, it's made me a better epidemiologist, maybe a better supervisor for my team, um, because I understand what the groundwork looks like. I understand um, that it's probably the hardest job I've ever had. Uh, was when we were doing case interviews at the beginning of this um, and when people weren't really trusting the local health department. They weren't trusting the state health department. Um, they thought we were part of the media. You know, they, you know, there was, I can't count how many times I've been yelled at and cussed out on the phone because, you know, I asked someone for their address um, or, you know, told them that they tested positive. Um, so it's, and it's, you know, I think we're all experiencing this, but every day is a, a completely different challenge from the day before. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, since I've had this role, no two days have remotely looked the same um, since the beginning. Um, and it's a lot of long hours, but like I said, it's, it's so important in understanding sort of what the basis of basic epidemiology is and, and understanding what the importance of case interviews are and what uh, contact tracing is and understanding why it's important for us to have good data um, because that's how we understand what communities are being um, affected more than others. That's how we understand um, how pre-existing conditions play into this. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's how we are able then to make decisions. And, um, you know, there's also uh, an aspect of this where uh, we have to convince policymakers and lawmakers uh, that this is a problem. Um, which is also not something I ever thought I would have to do in the middle of a pandemic would be like, hey, no, look, this is actually a problem. Um, like, listen to the experts, listen to the science. I never thought, you know, um, that that would be something I would have to do, um, not necessarily in this role, but um, externally with some other colleagues, we've been doing this. But it's, uh, it really shows you the importance of it. And it also shows you, you know, this is also where we're seeing like public health is still really underfunded. 
um, in the middle of a pandemic. And it's, it's hard to stop a pandemic when you don't have your basic resources for a health department. Um, so it's, it's, an, I, it's a really great job. It's, it's really, uh, I'm learning stuff all the time. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's tough work. And I think it's often something that we forget, especially as we move on. Yeah, well, thank you for the, the work that you're doing. Um, I appreciate sure. you taking all those those creases and all those ev- ev- all those bad things and just keep on pushing on and doing your work. You are a superhero, as I, I told someone in a other recent podcast. Um, so definitely thank you for all the work that you've been doing. So I guess my, my next question before I move on to the Furious Five is, what, what do you see for yourself in the future? Like, what, what is your goal for, for yourself moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I would, uh, I would absolutely love to go back to CDC and do operative response. Um, I've always wanted to do uh, EIS um, in the public health service, and that's something that I, I'm really looking forward to hopefully having that opportunity. Um, outbreak response is something that I really love, um, and I love having to approach it from a social and behavioral background um, to making sure we're doing uh, response in a way that, uh, that honors and accepts what the communities are doing and their values and their cultures. Um, so I'm, I'm really hoping I'm able to be back at CDC or, or at a, a state health department doing outbreak response. Um, but I also wouldn't count academia completely out. Um, I think it'd have to be a really, really good gig for me to stay in academia. Um, and I think academia also has a lot of growing and changing to do before that would be uh, something I would even consider. Um, but hopefully I'll, I'll be doing outbreak response stuff. Okay, awesome. And good luck. I, I hope you, you get to work at the CDC or a local or state health department and doing that work. If, yeah. if I may ask, what, what is your, I guess, your angst against academia right now? Um, I think academia has uh, a lot of hierarchical structures. Um, I'll give an example. <laughs> so um, someone who's a research professor um, is going to make more than someone who is simply a teaching professor. Um, and that's not fair. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, understanding that yes, part of their salary does come from the research portfolio. Um, but also that somebody teaching, that doesn't mean that they're not working as hard. That doesn't mean that they don't have the same amount of hours work. That doesn't mean that they don't have the same qualifications or background. Um, and that's something that I really struggle with, um, especially as someone right now who's on the, the research side of academia is, is understanding that, um, you know, there are colleagues that are literally on the other side of the hall as some of my faculty members that might not be making as much simply because their research portfolios aren't as large um, or they're not in the same research center that I'm in. Um, and I think that that's really problematic um, because it, it makes people not want to teach classes unless that's truly their passion. Um, I think it also is, is when it comes to research and academia, um, there's not a, a ton of... Um, positions for people who don't want to be the PI on a, on a project. Um, there's not a lot of positions for people who don't want to be the one in charge, the one who's it's their grant, that sort of stuff. Um, so I think that there's a lot of changing that I think also uh, higher education in general is uh, problematic in a lot of ways. I think it's, um, there's a lot of gatekeeping that happens and a lot of things that make uh, higher education and research inaccessible to, to uh, people and communities that really need it. Um, and that should have access to it because it's education is a right. Um, you know, so I think there's a lot of things like that um, that I might just be a little too hopeful that it'll change. Um, but I also think that there's also the, the ability for me to be a catalyst for change if I do go into academia. Um, so it's not something I would totally count out, but I think that um, academia has a lot of growing uh, to do. And I think once it does do some growing that we'll see a lot more equitable education happening um, and will produce a lot more equitable uh, research and, and scholarly interventions um, and just sort of be a little bit better for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you for pointing that out. And, and that definitely sounds like an equity issue. And I, I hope that that does get solved um, going into the future. So moving on to the last part of the show, the Furious Five, the five questions I ask all guests. Um, question number one. What advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? Um, I would say be confident in yourself. Uh, You have a set of skills. uh, You have knowledge. You have background. um, And don't sell yourself short. Uh, When I applied to my master's programs, uh, part of the reason I applied to so many was because I was like, I'll probably get into like two and then like I won't have two decisions. 
Um, but you have a background and you have valuable uh, experience, whether it be um, at a non-government organization like a charity or something, or whether it's at a health department. Um, so be confident in your experiences, be confident in your knowledge and the education you've received um, and go for it. I mean, it's also, you know, if you think you're qualified, apply. Um, you know, the worst you can get told is no. Um, I hate being told no for applications and for jobs. Um, but it's also, it's, it's one of those things that it might just work out. Um, how it did with me at Emory, um, that was one that I was already expecting to know when I hit submit. Um, and it turned out to be one of the best decisions I've ever made. So I would definitely say like, trust your process, trust that you're capable and you're, uh, you're qualified. Okay, thank you. Number two, if you were talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? Uh, I would probably echo the, what I just said. Um, I think confident in your skills. Um, I think also is uh, networking is important. Um, if you have opportunities to take research positions um, to do that, um, that's part of the reason I'm in my current position is because they saw that I worked with Dr. Berg um, at Emory. Um, and that was something for them that she's major in the field of uh, tobacco and vaping. So they saw that I was worked with her and I was a graduate assistant with her. And they immediately knew that that meant that I knew how to do research. That meant that I knew a little bit going into, into this job. So I would definitely say, um, look for experiences, um, be confident in yourself. And I would also add, get to know faculty members. Um, faculty members, if, if you're on, I mean, faculty members are not scared to pull some strings um, if they think it's something that uh, you, I don't wanna say earned, because um, that's not really what it is, but it's, you know, if, if they think it'll be a good place for you and they have the ability to put in a good word, uh, most of the time they will. Um, so get to know your faculty members. Um, and they also just like give really good life advice. Um, like they, like a lot of my faculty members, I was like, you did what? And I was like, and they're like, this is what I learned from. I was like, okay, that makes sense now. Like I now understand. Um, but I, I think that's another big thing that um, is just like know your faculty members, know your staff members, um, you know, know Miss Pam at Rollins. Everyone knows and loves Miss Pam. Get to know people like Miss Pam too. Awesome. Number three. What's something you're working on improving in, in your life right now? Uh, turning off my work email after uh, hours. Um, it's, you know, it's tough when you're a supervisor in the middle of a pandemic, mm -hmm. supervising people that are doing investigations. Um, but it's also something that I've gotten a lot better at um, because the reality is, it's like, if I get a call at 10 or 1030, like there's not a whole lot I can do. Um, or, you know, I can answer an email, but like they're probably not going to read until the morning anymore. Um, so I think that's also something that's just a healthy work-life balance is understanding when to cut off your phone and when to cut off your email um, so that you really have some, some you time. Absolutely. Number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? Um, I do. So one of my favorite organizations right now is actually Black Health. Um, and they're actually, they made this shirt. Um, <laughs> it's essentially their, their racism as a public health type shirt. It's B-L-K-H-L-T-H, Black Health. Um, and it was created by Two, two or three Rollins grads um, to, to address uh, health in the black community around Atlanta. Um, and they're doing a lot of incredible stuff right now, especially um, in the past couple of months around um, understanding race, public health, um, and then ad additionally how COVID is affecting um, the black community. I also would recommend, um, oh man, what's the name of that book? I had it and then I lost it. Um, <laughs> If you want, you can, you, you, you can take your time. You can like Google it now and I can just cut this out. <laughs> or if, if it's that important. <laughs> it's, it's whatever. I don't even remember it at this point. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But um, Black Health is, is really great. And they do some podcasts. Um, I also would recommend, um, I'm also like an epi nerd, so it's cool to me. But um, the Society for Epidemiologic Research has a couple of podcasts um as well as um her twitter name is epi ellie and i forgot what her actual last name is um, but she also has a, a really cool podcast about epidemiology um that's like uh just really really fun and listen to like it's just it's fun um which is weird to think about like her talking about like bayesian methods and you're like oh this is great and you're like wait this is not great um and then finally my uh, one of my favorite podcasts is called no jargon um and it's where uh, scholars from their field have to give short talks about their research, uh, but they can't use scientific terms. Um, so they have to do it like they're talking to someone who knows absolutely nothing about science, absolutely nothing about research, 
Um, and it's also a really easy way. They're like 15 or 20 minutes long. Um, they're an easy way, like, it's how I keep up on research in other fields too. Um, like education research is on there a lot, psychology, and like all of those research fields that like I don't have time to read up on. Um, you know, you get a quick like 15, 20 minute uh, snippet of what's going on in those areas. And I think that's, that's a really, really awesome podcast that I, I really suggest. Yeah, that is awesome. I'm definitely going to be checking that one out. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, and last but not least, where can people connect with you? So I'm on Facebook, Robert Fairman. I'm on Instagram, rfair94. And then I'm on Twitter, FairmanRT. Um, and, and that's how you can connect with me. And I'm off, obviously like on LinkedIn, all those fun things too. Okay, awesome. And I'll be sure to link all of that in the show notes. Um, this is going to be episode 19. So the phmillennial.com slash episode 19. Um, awesome. Yeah, so thank you so much for being on, Robert. I really appreciate you sharing your story and your perspectives on public health, and I wish you nothing but the best moving forward. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you once again for tuning in. Um, you know, this means a lot to me if you listen or watch these episodes. It definitely um, has kept me going, and I hope that I'm always bringing value and helping you. Um, as I've said before, I'm going to be taking a break for two weeks after the, the episode after this one, so after so after episode 20. But if you want any of the show notes from this episode, just go to thephmillennial.com forward slash episode 19, and everything will be there. But I hope everyone's doing well. Public Health Millennial out.